Okay, welcome back everybody to lecture number three today on our course 308, Revelation and Daniel. I hope all of you are still there and <laughs> you're taking it in. Hope it's not too heavy. All right. So we were reading through Revelation 18 and uh, looking at this other thing called Babylon the Great. And it's quite obvious as you read through all this great city Babylon, which is different from mystery Babylon, chapter 17. So it's quite clear as you read through Revelation 18 that this great city Babylon is talking about a global economic system because people are buying and selling and, and um, oh, brother Mono I think you need to mute your mic okay. right. so um, it's talking about a global economic system people are buying and selling so we, we read till uh, was uh, 18 right? and um, what I want to point out very sadly is, and this is in the end of verse 13, that very sadly, this economic system was not only selling goods like you know, wealth and I mean money and material things, it says they were selling bodies and souls of men. So, you know, what we would refer to in our modern language we call it human trafficking so this this global economic system and is you know it's not only selling money they are selling bodies and souls of men i just wanted to point that out let's finish reading chapter 18 please uh, we will pick up from Verse 19, read the rest of it, and it'll just become more obvious, you know, what this is. Verse 19 on, three verses each, please. They threw, they threw dust on their heads and uh, cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she has made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it in, into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. Thank you. Verse 22 to 24, somebody? Someone? The sound of the harpist, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters. Okay. Not sure what happened. All right. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. So it's quite obvious here, you know, Revelation 18, when you look at all the details, you see that this is referring to a world economic system, people buying and selling, that here at this point, right? So right, remember where we are. We are like at the very end of the sev seven years of tribulation. The seven bowls have, the final judgment, seven bowls have been poured out. The sixth bowl has signaled the beginning of 
the build up towards the battle of armageddon nations are getting together you know getting to move into battle all that's happening and at that time god pours his judgment on babylon one is this world religious system that has deceived the nations multitudes of people and secondly this global economic system which everybody was vested in they were you know buying and selling and doing all these things and the the rich people of the earth the great people of the earth it says in verse 23 the great people of the earth were all you know invested in it and uh, everything collapses in a moment in, in within an hour and sadly he saw here that verse 24 the blood of prophets and saints were so that means this economic system also attacked prophets and saints so you saw the mystery babylon the blood of the martyrs attacking god's people great city babylon Attacking God's people. That means wealth was used, money was used to go against the people of God. Religious system was used to go against the people of God. Wealth was used to go against the people of God. And God is avenging both in causing these things to collapse. So this brings us to this final, final act, which is the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 19. So in heaven, there is what we read uh, in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you know, God is celebrating with all the saints who have come there. There's this great marriage supper of the Lamb. And then the Lord Jesus steps out to move in. So on the earth, armies are being mobilized to go against Israel. And in heaven, there's this marriage supper of the Lamb. That's done. And the Lord Jesus comes to the earth. So let's read Revelation 19. And we will see this final act before the curtain is drawn on that seven years of tribulation. Revelation 19, let's um, read through it. Um, we will go from verses 1 to 10. Somebody has a question, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, yes, Pastor, oh. sorry. Sorry go to ahead. draw you back. I, I, I was just reading along the lines, you know, and uh, I noticed if we look at history of the Babylon, um, Babylon itself, where the Israelites were in captivity for 70 years. There seems to be some similarities with um, that Babylon then and this Babylon. I don't know if it's still referring to that same Babylon or uh, this is another economic um, setting or system that would be um, present during this time. I, I just wanted to gain more clarity again on this. Mm -hmm. Right. So like we said, uh, you know, the Babylon um, refers to three things. One is there is the, the place, Babylon, which a lot of things have happened. You know, the Tower of Babel was built there. The people of Israel were there for captive. Uh, all those things, the physical place, things that have happened. But the thing that significantly differentiates Mystery Babylon and the Great City Babylon is its global influence. The, the physical geog geograph geographical location Babylon didn't have a global influence, right? It, things happen, they're localized. But mystery Babylon is something that sits over all peoples, nations. So it's a big difference between the geographic Babylon and mystery Babylon. Same thing with this great city Babylon. It's global influence. Merchants from all the earth, what we just read, 
they were they were trading with in this. So today nobody does any business with Babylon at all. Iraq is among the poorest nations in the earth. I mean, I'm talking about in 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 looking at it from that perspective. But this Babylon is very different. Like you know, uh, so. It's very different. This Babylon, everybody's trading. The great men of the earth are involved in it. They're doing so. It sets. It's you know. It's it's very clear that we could say it's not talking about the geographic Babylon, which today, in modern day, would be the nation of Iraq, where the city of Babylon is. But it's talking about a global economic system because everybody all over the world are participating in it. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Sounds good. Let's go into chapter 19. Let's read, please, verses 1 to 10, 3 verses each. After this, I heard what sounded like the ra of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four. Twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God and all your servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunders, crying out, Hallelujah to the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Thank you. Sir. Mm -hmm. Let us be glad, glad and rejoice God. and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet. To worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Mm. Amen. So, chapter 19 begins with you know a celebration about the judgment on Babylon. God has avenged his people, and uh, so. Both Mystery Babylon, Great City of Babylon, so which we just saw, Revelation 17, 18. Then it's okay. Let's get ready for the final thing, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And her wife has made herself ready. And this is basically when you're talking about the his wife. Verse 8 talks about the saints who've been clothed in righteousness. So they are there, and there's this great feast. So the marriage supper is, is just is, in a, is a picture of a great celebration of Jesus, of the Lord, the Lamb, with all of his redeemed people. It's like this, this high point, this great celebration, the marriage of the Lamb uh, taking place in heaven. Now, um, verse 10, you know, the, this elder who's speaking to John, John falls down to worship him and he says, you know, I, I'm just a fellow servant, one of your brethren. So this is where we get some idea on who one of the elders are. It's somebody who served the Lord and possibly a Jewish man, your brethren, he says, verse 10, sorry, verse 10. And um, worship Jesus. And then he says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
So testimony of Jesus meaning what Jesus is speaking, what Jesus is saying. That is the spirit or what inspires prophecy. Right? So what is all true prophecy? True prophecy is us saying what Jesus is saying. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that's one way of understanding this. It means what Jesus is saying is what gives birth to prophecy. When you say what Jesus is saying, that's prophecy. Now remember, the Holy Spirit speaks to us what Jesus is saying. So what Jesus says is spoken to us by the Holy Spirit, and then we speak that. That's prophecy. Okay? So prophecy is us speaking what Jesus is saying as we hear from the Holy Spirit. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So how, the marriage supper of the Lamb is over. The next final thing, the Lord moves onto the earth. Verse 11 onwards, please, from chapter 19, verse 11 to 21, three verses each. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and with justice do he judge and fight. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many diadems, and he had a name written, which no man knoweth but himself. And he was clothed, clothed with a garment sprinkled with blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Thank you. And the armies of in heaven arrayed in fine light, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, verse 17 on. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sit who sat on the throne in his and against his army. What's twenty and twenty one, please? Then the beast was captured, and with his with him the first prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with the fresh mm. flesh. Okay. So... What do we see here? The final act, and we're going to we'll just we'll we'll read a few other uh, scriptures here. We see the Lord coming out of heaven, and John is describing, you know, uh, someone who's so powerful, someone majestic. Now, whether Jesus comes literally riding on a white horse, or whether he just comes, uh, you know. Uh, we don't know, if, I mean, whether it's, it doesn't matter. Um, the reason is, Jesus riding on a white horse is symbolic of, you know, somebody, the conqueror, the, the uh, 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 army general coming forth. But we, we know what the angels said in Acts chapter 1. They said, this same Jesus, uh, you know, will come in so like manner as you have seen him go. So when he went, he, we don't see him going riding on a horse. <laughs> So, you know, th there can be this question, well, he didn't go on a horse. They said he'll come the way he went. 
you know, so is he literally going to come on a horse or not? So okay, let's not worry about it. Uh, Revelation 19 could be just expressing to us that he's coming in such great power and glory and as, 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 a, as a king, as a warrior. The first time he came, he came as a humble little child. Now he's coming as a mighty warrior, conquering king. That could be the picture of Revelation 19. Um, but then it tells us about you know what's going to happen, that with the word of his mouth, he's going to destroy the kings of the earth. With the word of his mouth, there's going to be so much, you know, just the, the judgment there at that moment. Uh, it's going to be so great. Uh, and uh, the, the beast and the false prophet who deceived the nations will be caught or will be uh, captured. And they will be, and those who worshipped with him, worshipped him, they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Let's just cross-reference a few passages to just give us more light on this. Uh, we will read the book of Jude, which is just the which is the little book just before Revelation. So we just go before Revelation, Jude. And could somebody please read to us verses 14 and 15? Jude. Jude 14 and 15. Enoch, the servant from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them, all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness. And of all the defilement words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Mm. So, Jude is telling us, Enoch prophesied. Now, we don't have a written record of uh, Enoch's prophecy. I mean, the sense that we, do, we don't have it here in the scripture. So, Jude uh, must have obtained it from uh, some other writings or maybe by revelation. But he said, Enoch prophesied the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So you're not prophesying. Look, this is what's going to happen. The Lord is coming with thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Right? Now, when we read the book of Zechariah, so let's go to Zechariah. You know, Zechariah chapter 14 uh, describes to us what exactly will happen here at the battle of Armageddon. Let's read, please. We will just read verses 1 to 4, and then I will I'll mention, I'll point out some of the other verses in this chapter. But can we read verses, oh, sorry, 1 to 4, 1 to 4. Uh, Zechariah 14, 1 to 4. Somebody can read it. Zechariah Go ahead. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will, get, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem, the city shall be taken, the houses were filled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in, the, and in that day his feet will stand on Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making... Make, uh, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the uh, toward the north, and half half of it toward the south. Mm -hmm. So, very interesting that Zechariah prophesied about this battle of Armageddon, how things will end. He's saying the day of the Lord is coming, and he said, nations are going to come against Jerusalem. But the Lord will fight. And then he makes this very, very significant statement. Verse 4. In that day, his feet, the Lord's feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives. Very significant. Zechariah, how do you know? How do you know that the Lord is going to stand on this mountain? 
but he's prophesying. And several hundred years later, the Lord Jesus ascends from the Mount of Olives. And as he's ascending, the angels are saying, Jesus will come in the same way. And so you connect the two. He ascended from Mount of Olives. He is going to descend there. And Zechariah prophesied, Zechariah 14, 4, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He's going to come. He's going to land there. And, and there's going to be such a great shaking. The Mount of Olives is going to be uh, divided. Then I'm going to just highlight a few things from chapter 14. Just please, uh, please follow with me. Verse 5, second half. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Think about it. Jude prophesied, uh, not Jude, Enoch prophesied, which we read in Jude 1. Jude, that the Lord will come with all his saints. Zechariah prophesied, the Lord will come with all his saints. Revelation 19, the Lord will come with all the armies of heaven. And so we are seeing how this is being repeated. And uh, I'll just point a few verses uh, here. Um, verse 8, he talks about a river which will flow from Jerusalem. Uh, this parallels what Ezekiel wrote about the Millennial Temple. Ezekiel chapters 40, 44 to 48, he talks about a river flowing out of Jerusalem. Uh, so that will happen here. It's repeated here in Zechariah 14.8. Verse 9, Zechariah 14.9, the Lord will be king over all the earth, and the Lord will rule. So God is going to rule. The Lord is going to rule from Jerusalem. He's going to rule from there. Verse 12, what will happen when the Lord strikes the nations? It says, verse 12, the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. So, some, you know, this is just, just the word of the Lord and something strange is going to happen. People are, you know, he's talking about this, how people are going to be destroyed. After that, he says, verses 16 onwards, we're still in Zechariah 14. Okay, so now this you're getting into the millennium after the Lord sets up his kingdom, which we will read in Revelation 20. But just as a preview here, Zechariah said, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them, uh, on them there will be no rain. And then he continues, how nations are going to come to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. Okay, this is Zechariah 14, 16 on. So there's this great battle of Armageddon, where the Lord Jesus will come, the armies of the heavens will come, by just the word of his mouth, he will destroy all the nations that are gathered against Jerusalem. He's going to descend on the Mount of Olives, and uh, you know the, the, the Mount of Olives is going to be split, and all of that. And uh, he is going to set up his throne in Jerusalem. And this is where what Daniel had described. You know, there is that that forty-five days gap. Uh, that we read in Daniel chapter 12, which would probably be the time of just cleaning up everything physically. And uh, a new temple, the millennial temple being established. A river flowing out of Jerusalem. You know, possibly because you know, the Mount of Olives is being split and you know, God will cause the fountain to cause this river to flow. And all of that being happening at that time. And the Lord setting up his kingdom to rule from Jerusalem, everyone who has received the mark of the beast will be taken out. That's back in Revelation 19, verse 20. And there's going to be the ushering in of 
a millennium. So this is chapters 20, 21, and 22. Right? So let's get in to Revelation chapter 20. All right, so we flip back from Zechariah 14 back into Revelation chapter 20. You all with me so far? Okay. All right. So let's read. Uh, let's see how far we go, and then you know we will probably finish it up next week. Let's see. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6, please. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Verse 4 to 6, somebody? And there's no thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who, who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Mm. Okay. So what do we see here? As the Lord sets up his millennial kingdom, certain things happen. The first thing is this. The serpent of old, Satan and his demons, are bound for 1,000 years. He's put it shut up in the bottomless pit, and Satan and his demons are removed out of the earth for 1,000 years. So that's how he begins that millennial rule. Then we see that those who had died in faith during the tribulation, are raised up. So that's the first resurrection. Our first, in the sense, first resurrection after the tribulation period. That's the first resurrection. There's going to be another one that's coming when, when every other person, every other person is going to be raised up from the earth. But this is the first resurrection right after the tribulation. Now remember, we spoke about the 144,000 Jews during the tribulation, Revelation 14, we said it may be that they may have been resurrected, given their glorified bodies at that time in Revelation 14, because it says that they became the first fruits. So possible they were raised up with a special. But after the tribulation, those who died during the tribulation for the witness to Jesus are raised up in this first resurrection. Now, this makes us think a little bit. If this first resurrection is very, which he mentions here in Revelation 25, is very specific to and for those who died for their witness to Jesus during the tribulation. What about all the other saints who were not there during the tribulation, who died before the tribulation? What about them? Oh, they were raised up just before the tribulation in the rapture of the church. So, that, again, it's kind of a reverse logic, meaning if this first resurrection after the tribulation is specific to those who died during the tribulation, then you work backwards, 
then it's logical to say that everybody else who didn't die during the tribulation should have been resurrected sometime prior, which is therefore it leads us back to it had to be a pre tribulation resurrection. That means all the saints, all the saints receive their glorified bodies in the rapture of the church just prior to the beginning of the tribulation. Those who died in faith during the tribulation are part of this first resurrection after the tribulation. It's possible the 144,000 Jews may have, as a special case, experienced the resurrection prior to this first resurrection. They became the first fruits. What will this? So it says in verse 6 they, we are all going to reign with him a thousand years. So Jesus sets up this thousand year reign. And we're reigning with him. Now we know. We read in Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel said, The saints are given the kingdom and we will reign. First Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, Don't you know that the saints will reign on the earth and they'll reign over angels, they'll rule over angels? Yeah, that's happening here. One thousand years we're gonna reign on the earth. What will life be like during the millennium? We have few insights. We have few insights. We can cross-reference a little bit of Zechariah 14, which we just read. Uh, we can cross-reference Isaiah chapter 11, also Isaiah chapter 65, where it describes what life will be during the millennium. It says, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65, that the very nature of things will change. Because the, uh, Isaiah describes and says, the lion will lie down with a lamb. The child will play you know, with a snake. People will learn war no more. They will beat their swords into plowshares. Uh, the nations will say, let us go up and worship God in Jerusalem. And people will take hold of a Jew and say, teach us about the ways of the Lord. Uh, and uh, people, life will go on. People will, you know, uh, will do things. Now, Isaiah, in his language, says they will plant vineyards and they will build houses because that was the, the, the understanding that he had. But it means that life will go on. People will be doing business. They will be cultivating. They will be doing everything during the thousand year reign. And we will be administering the kingdom. And uh, nations will be told to come and worship Jesus. So, you know, people ask other questions like, will there be, pe be people being born during the millennium? Isaiah 65 says, yeah, people will be born, people will die. So there will be the people with glorified bodies on the earth, and there will be pe the natural people who have come through the millennium who are continuing to live on the earth. These are people who did not receive the mark of the beast, but they, neither did they believe in Jesus. They, they were just on the earth, and they continued doing what they did, but now they have the opportunity to believe in Jesus. So there will be the uh, procreation and the increase of the natural man as well, the people, and we will be teaching them. The big difference is there will be no demonic influence on the earth during that 1,000 year reign. And at the end of the 1,000 years, we come to verse 7, Revelation 20. Uh, maybe we'll just read till verse 10 and let's see. How far we can get. Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10, please. Somebody could read it. Now, when now the, in the thousand years, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog 
to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of the heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and the brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay. So, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be released for a little while like it says in Revelation 20 verse 3 he'll be released for a little while now we don't know what a little while is uh, but I'm you know I'm assuming it's a very short period of time we don't know exactly what that little while is Revelation 20 verse 3 he'll be released for a little while and um, he his immediate work is to deceive nations And it's very interesting that uh, he's going to have try to deceive on the four corners of the earth. That's verse eight, meaning he's, this, he's going to try to deceive. He and his demons are going to try to deceive people all over the earth. So now just try to imagine this: the Lord Jesus is sitting in Jerusalem. He's, he's ruling on the earth, and he's been ruling physically on the earth for one thousand years, and we have administ been administering this kingdom. And yet, Satan is going to try to deceive. And he succeeds. So you can think about this. If you go back in time, to when Satan was an archangel, he was the first person to be self-deceived. When he said, I will take the place of the Most High. But he was able to transmit that deception to one third of the angels who were in the very presence of God. So, how strong is the deceptive force of Satan? You, know, you look back in time, he was able to deceive uh, one third of the angels and take them with him. Here in Revelation 20. The Lord Jesus is ruling in Jerusalem. Satan and his demons are released for a brief period of time and they're able to deceive people on the earth. Now Gog and Magog are specifically pointed out. Uh, you actually we read about them uh, even in Ezekiel chapter 38 as people, uh, the, 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 the tribes uh, associated with them, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, uh, which most 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 Bible scholars say are now part of Russia. So he's able to deceive, and for whatever reason, you know, by name, these these this region is pointed out uh, that these descendants specifically, who are now in modern Russia, are you know are also there. They they deceived. And they make Satan tries to get them to make one final attempt against the this beloved city, city of Jerusalem. But fire comes down from God and he stops this whole thing. But notice verse 8 says that the number of people he's able to gather together is like the sand of the sea, meaning a large number. That means Satan is able to deceive so many people in such a short time, get them to come against Jesus Christ and the beloved city. But God intervenes. I think one of the things I just want to highlight here is how strong the deception of the enemy is. That he's able to deceive people, deceive nations even though Jesus has been ruling and is physically ruling in Jerusalem, he's able to deceive nations. See, sometimes we pray, we say, Lord, 
you reveal yourself, you appear to us and we will believe. But sometimes the deception of the devil can be so great and which we are seeing here in Revelation 20, the Lord Jesus is ruling in Jerusalem and yet people can be deceived. That means we've got to focus on the truth, we've got to focus on God, if we have to, and we have to guard ourselves against demonic deception, because deception is Satan's if you want to use the word most powerful weapon. That's what he does here. He deceives the people. He deceives the nations. Revelation 20, verse 8. So think about this. We will pause here. So we will continue next week. Uh, next week, Thursday, will be our final set of lectures. I'm sure we'll finish uh, the remaining portion of Revelation. And if there are any other questions we can take up, I, I, I'm assuming we should be able, be able to finish the rest in one or two hours next week. And uh, we will wrap this up. Okay. Any questions before we close off for today? Pastor, some explanation about this uh, first resurrection stated in chapter 20 and verse 6. Mm -hmm. And uh, resurrection of the saints who died before tribulation. Some explanation on these two will be helpful. Yes. So what we are saying is, uh, Revelation 20 says that, which Revelation 20 verse 6 says, this is the first resurrection after the tribulation where those who die believing in Jesus during the tribulation will be raised. It's called the first resurrection. Context is first resurrection after the tribulation. So we ask the question, what about all the others who believed in Jesus, who lived way before or the saints, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, the church, saints in the church, who believed in Jesus before the tribulation. What about all of them? When will they be resurrected? Because they have to be ruling on the earth with Jesus. So, we have to work backwards. Well, the rapture, the which Paul describes for us, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, where the Lord descends and they are raised, we are caught up to be with Him forever in the air. We are caught up to be with Him in the air. That resurrection takes care of all the saints before. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints receive their glorified bodies. That's before the tribulation. Then at the end of the tribulation, those who died during, like he says, Revelation 20, verse 6, those who died during the will be part of this first resurrection post tribulation. Now, when we come in the millennium, there will be people who die, who believe in the Lord and die physically with the natural bodies. Everyone will then be raised at the end of the millennium. That's another resurrection coming. Right? Some will go to eternal life, some. Uh, the rest of them will go to hell, separated from God. So, is that clear? Here it is, uh, uh, specifically it says, resurrection of the people who died during the tribulation. The, the first resurrection refers to the people who died during tribulation. That means it is, it is a resurrection after the first resurrection after the tribulation. So one resurrection has already happened before the tribulation, during the rapture. Yes, I'm a, correct. I'm a, I'm a right. yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 So, okay. so when it says, this is the first resurrection, we understand it in context. It's the first resurrection after the tribulation. tribulation. That's okay. what, thank you. Thank that's you. That's the con context. Thank you.
Okay. Sounds good. Any other questions? All right. So let's close in prayer. We'll catch up again next week, Thursday. I will um, share this with you. And I will also, um, maybe before we close off, I will share with you, you know, um, some options for those who are interested in ministering, we're doing ministry with us anywhere in the world. Uh, last year, we, we talked about, we spoke about the church planting accelerator program, which we had opened up only for people in India. But we will, uh, and then next week, I'll just share some thoughts on, you know, how, uh, if you want to work with us from anywhere in the world, we will try to put that together. And you can think about it, and then you can contact us. Right, for, but that's specifically for those who finished three years of study with us. Right? So if you've done three years, then we'd like to open up that opportunity and, and then take that forward. Okay? I'll share that with you next week. Let's close in prayer, and we will dismiss, please. Somebody could pray with us. Can I pray? Yes. Go ahead, Ken. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, this wonderful uh, time that we had uh, just learning and uh, seeing everything that you have uh, foretold and uh, things that are going to come to pass, God. Um, Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, using uh, your uh, people, your apostles, and uh, those that are willing, God, to just... Uh, um, bring uh, in revelations and bring in uh, insights from you, Lord. Uh, thank you, God, that uh, you would help us uh, to uh, um, to do what you have uh, asked us to do, and that uh, we would be um, we would uh, obey you um, and be an example to others. God, thank you, Lord, for uh, this time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your afternoon or the rest of the day. Uh, we'll catch up again next week. See you. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you.